And so I sat on that man's toilet seat. I did. <laughs> I did. So I had to evolve. After moving from Mississippi to Washington, D.C., I was determined to rid myself of my racially tinged upbringing. I did several things to make a change. I straightened my hair. I erased my Southern accent completely. I even became a Republican. <laughs> I had evolved to become the quintessential, well-heeled political staffer right here in Washington, D.C. So when my boss invited me on a trip to my home state, to my hometown for an event, of course, I said yes. I was very prepared. I had carefully crafted my identity. My mask was on. I was ready to face the world. So the day of the trip comes. We board a private jet. We start flying and my boss mid-air turns to me and says, you know we're going to a meet and greet at John Thoroughbred's home. I look like a deer in headlights at that moment. What do you mean? No one mentioned that to me. Now, just so you know, John Thoroughbred is a longtime Mississippi politician. Everybody knows him. He's rich, he's powerful, and he lives in one of the grandest homes along the water. Growing up, my parents and I used to do a drive along that stretch of homes on Sundays after church. We used to call it our Sunday drive. Truthfully, it was our wishful thinking drive. <laughs> but the Mississippi that I grew up in, it wasn't the 60s or the 70s, but it was still very much divided. I mean, even in school, we would elect two vice presidents, one black, one white. That was normal for us as kids. And that area along the beach, the grand columned homes along the water, well, no one who looked like us had ever lived in those homes. I only knew one person who had even been inside those homes. It was my aunt, my Aunt Cake, my favorite aunt. She was the caretaker and maid for the thoroughbred family before her death. When we were growing up, my aunt, she was a slight woman, you know, she. She uh, had darkened prescription glasses long before that sort of thing was fashionable. <laughs> and I always, I called her Aunt Cake because, well, she made my favorite cake. So, <laughs> but growing up, you know, she also worked at night as a janitor at the local newspaper. And I remember growing up, we would go to the paper. My mom would take us there and we would sit and they would talk about the latest episode of The Young and the Restless. And I would sit there at the table, swinging my legs, just watching the reams of newspaper come off the machine. And I would soak in that smell of newspaper. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I think that those nights there with my aunt, the maid, is actually how I got into writing. And so my mind is filled with all these thoughts of my childhood and that life when suddenly I realize that this plane I'm on is about to land and I start to get nervous, you know. What if they realize that I've been faking? What if they figure out who you really are? I don't want to go in this house. I am dying to go in this house. <laughs> so the plane lands and suddenly I find myself face to face with the one and only John Thoroughbred. He had come onto the plane to greet us. Um, hi, I'm Janelle. He looks larger than life. You know, his hair is perfectly brushed, not a strand out of place. He looks just like he looks on TV. At that moment, I realized I had come face to face with the power structure that guided my childhood back then. And it was pretty heavy. I didn't know what to do. So we go ahead, we get in the cars, we head to the, to the home, and I realize as we're driving to the thoroughbred home that I'm suddenly on the wishful thinking drive again, except this time I'm in a police escort. We go along and we get to the house, and I go inside and I just take it all in, this home and everything that I'm seeing. I mean, there are like perfectly floral painted walls there. They have wide wood beam floors and even have pedophores on a buffet server. You know, it was just like my mother used to have 
but we only had it at Easter. It wasn't a normal thing when people came over. I couldn't believe I was here, and I wanted to see more of this house. Um, where's your restroom? <laughs> Mrs. Thoroughbred points me down the hallway, the main hallway, and I go inside, and I flip on the light, and I take the biggest Mary Tyler Moore spin I had ever taken, because <laughs> I'm in here. And I just look at it, and I mean, there are gold light fixtures, and they're perfectly painted walls. And I turn around, and I touch the toilet seat like it was a hot pan, <laughs> to be honest. And suddenly, I have this thought, you know, has anyone like me ever been here? Was my aunt here in this space? What if I held my own sort of sit-in right now? <laughs> it could be quick, but boy, would it be effective. And it would be so apropos to leave a little bit of myself behind <laughs> after growing up as a little black girl in the Deep South. I take a quick look around. <laughs> I don't know why. But I slowly just lower down. <laughs> and seriously, as I'm doing, you know, all these thoughts are going through the thoughts of, you know, growing up in Mississippi. And, you know, I'm thinking about the time that we watched for the Klan to even come to our house when we were moving in. Or I thought about the, the club that my friends and I were dying to join when we were in high school, but we couldn't because they told us it's for white girls only. And I thought about my daddy and all the times he would just get in my ear and tell me, you have to be 10 times better than everybody else as a little black girl. And so I sat on that man's toilet seat. I did. <laughs> I did. And I just took a deep breath. <laughs> and as I sat up, I looked in the mirror, and all I could think was, Aunt Kate, I made it. 